Um, so again, we have with us today Dr. Paula Prado, who works with Roger Williams University. Um, do you know where that is? Um, yeah, Rhode, Rhode Island, exactly, down, down the street in Rhode Island. Um, and she's an assistant professor in communication. Um, and we're, the, really the topic she's talking about today is something that's been, that's being discussed all over the world uh, by universities and by big organizations, which is on digital inclusion. Um, and how do you include people who don't have access to the internet and do, who don't have access to communication technologies, how do you include them in this digital revolution that the rest of us are, um, at least we think we are part of. Um, so Dr. Prado has done um, all kinds of work on this topic. Some of the most exciting work she has done is on um, doing multimedia workshops in the Dominican Republic and in Colombia. She started that program with other colleagues. Um, and really the point of that program is to bring information and communication technologies to the most rural areas in the Dominican Republic and Colombia. If any of you have been to these countries, you definitely have not been to those specific areas that where Dr. Prado uh, works, areas where there is you know, virtually no electricity. Um, apart from that, her career um, was in media. She started working at Reuters and worked for, as a journalist for many years, um, specifically working in the US, in Washington, DC, but also in Latin America. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Um, Sanjeev is online right now. I'll leave it at that, and um, please, Dr. Prado, I'll turn the microphone on, on to you. Um, thank you again very much for being with us, and um, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Dr. Jambek. You might want to turn your uh, Skype uh, to do not disturb, so um, <laughs> uh, Mr. Chatterjee does not interrupt us. <laughs> I will, I will do that. Um, so, hi everybody. I'm so sorry I can't be there today. I was leaving the house all excited uh, to go see you this morning and I was all set and then I stumbled on the stairs and I hurt my foot. So because I drive a clutch, it became really difficult for me to drive and to go see you. So I apologize. I would have I'd love to meet you in person and I hope you can forgive me for not being there. So. Um, before I start talking about the research I do and the topic uh, of today's conversation, I wanted to first ask you a question. I'm curious to know um, how many people are there in the world? Does anybody know? What is the total global population? Six billion. More than seven billion. Six billion. More than seven billion. So six billion and more than seven billion. Yeah, it's, right now it's about 7.2 billion people. How many of those people have internet access, do you think? More than 1 billion. Half of them. Less than half. Five. <laughs> uh, less than half is right. About 39%, which is about 2.8 billion people have internet access. Um, I understand that most of you, like Dr. Jambeck and myself, are not born in the US, right? You're born abroad, so um, if you are from the Middle East, um, chances are that you are living uh, or you reside in a country where internet access is significantly lower than that, right? If you are coming from the global north, from Scandinavia, for example, uh, almost everybody could have internet access in that country. But in the country that I'm from, I was originally born in Brazil, um, there we still have many, many people who are disconnected. So the number there uh, is closer to the 30%, not uh, 39%. Um, but Google has a plan. Google just announced this past month that they are going to spend between one and three billion dollars to connect everybody. And you know how they're going to do it? They're going to send up 180 satellites to then be able to blanket the Earth. These are geostationary, low Earth orbiting satellites uh, that will make it possible uh, for everybody to be connected online and uh, wherever they can't get a satellite up to provide coverage they're sending up balloons big white balloons 
in a project that's called the Loon Project. And, and the Loon Project is, uh, it may sound loony, but it might just be what makes it possible uh, a, a 10 years from now for everybody on the Earth to be on Now, what that does is that it creates a lot more areas of research for me, because what I research is digital inclusion. Digital inclusion is the name we give to the study of how the other four billion people get online and what happens when they get online. So I specifically focus my research on what happens when people who did not have internet previously are finally able to log in. How do their lives change? What, if anything, happens to those communities? Um, and so uh, that's where I would like to take you now. I'd like to take you to one of the countries that I research. It is called the Dominican Republic. And the Dominican Republic is in the Caribbean. It is uh, half of one island that uh, contains two countries, Haiti on the western half and the Dominican Republic on the eastern half. Uh, might anybody know the name of that island? Any good geography students there? No? That island is called Hispaniola. Hispaniola, named after Spain, because it was the first place where Christopher Columbus set foot when he sailed from Genoa in Italy. And so when uh, this island was discovered, it was the first place that the Europeans arrived and the first place where the Europeans set up a settlement in the Americas, according to our historical records. There's some debate about the possibility that there were Vikings who arrived here, actually in the mouth of the Amazon River in South America, much earlier than that. But the first longest continuous, continuing running settlement inhabited by Europeans in the Americas is in, some, in the Dominican Republic, and it is in this particular village where I went to do my research. This village is called El Sable. So Dr. Jambeck, you can switch to the second uh, uh, PowerPoint slide. Okay, give me one minute, please. Oh, actually. Oh, see? Oh, good, it's worked. So we are so on the intro slide, and I guess I'm going to move forward to the first picture. Yes. So the first picture shows you the picture of some children at a monument, standing around a monument, that is the monument that celebrates the arrival of Columbus and the settlement of El Cebo, which is, again, the longest continuing European settlement in the Americas. It was established in 1506, so 1506, right? And actually, the person who stayed there uh, in the settlement was Christopher Columbus's brother. He stayed in this area, uh, and that is the, the area where uh, uh, this community has lived. You can go to the next slide. These are some of the children who live in this village. This village is still very impoverished. It is uh, a small town to this day, even though it has been inhabited for 500 years. It has one very poorly equipped hospital. It has uh, schools, so these children all go to school up to uh, the end of uh, high school. They are uh, given free uh, schooling, so they know how to read and write. Um, and uh, most of them will grow up to not get a university education like you're getting. Most of them will finish their studies in high school. Uh, many will work in menial jobs or they work in the countryside. Um, and some who uh, don't find work locally, this is a very impoverished area, they might migrate to the bigger cities to work. El Sable is about two and a half hours by car. Uh, or by bus to the capital of the Dominican Republic, which is called Santo Domingo. 
And uh, in the Dominican Republic, there are about 9 million Dominicans. One million of those actually don't even live in the Dominican Republic. They live in the U.S. Uh, they live primarily in New York, New Jersey, and we actually have uh, about 60,000 of them here in Rhode Island. Uh, there are a few in Massachusetts, too. Uh, but basically, this is a country where people, one out of every nine people, go abroad to work because there is... And many people uh, come abroad and come to the U.S., which is relatively close by, to work uh, in usually service work or clerical jobs, uh, if they can find them, manufacturing in the U.S., so they can send money back home to their families. And this is one of those communities. Just about every one of those children has somebody uh, in the U.S. Uh, in their family, right? And sometimes it's even a mother or a father or a brother or a sister who will come to the U.S. It's a very common thing for families to have that connection abroad. So if you want to switch the slide. Okay. Are we now in the slide with the bullfight or? Yes, yes we are. Okay. Yeah. So this uh, town then, El Sable, every first week of May holds what are called fiestas patronales. Those are those first two words you see there. This is a week-long celebration in honor of the Holy Cross. This is a mostly Catholic country, right? And this tradition comes back to uh, El Sable, of course, from Spain, right? Dominican Republic was a Spanish colony, and so uh, a lot of the traditions of the Spaniards, the food, the music, uh, and of course the language and other cultural traditions have infused this society. Uh, so the bull run that you see here is the famous Sevillanas. They're the bull uh, run that is typical of the area of Sevilla and, or Seville in Spain that is the bull, bull, bull run where they don't kill, they just tire out the bull, right? And every May, to honor the patron saint, they do hold uh, these uh, particular um, bull runs, and it's a two or three day event, and it, the entire town comes to attend, and a lot of people from all over the country actually visit. So if you can go to the next slide, Dr. Jambic, you will yep. see uh, one of the highlights of the Fiestas Patronales, which is basically the bugle player. And what is the one thing you notice about the bugle player? The bugle is that horn. It's a woman. She's a woman, right? This is not uh, apparently very tr traditional, right? So she is a woman, and she sounds the horn to start the bullfight and actually the bull run, since uh, they don't uh, push any pins into the back of the bull. And if you go to the next slide, you will see that the, the bull fighter and the horses uh, that come in to escort the bull fighter and the bull basically are introduced, the first person to come into the ring is this woman, a horsewoman, right? So again, uh, between the teenage bugle player and the uh, woman, the horsewoman that opens the race, you see um, a society that is in some ways bucking ma macho tradition, right? Not very much like uh, the machismo we see in Spain. However, and if you go to the next slide, Dr. Jambic, yep. we do see, of course, up in the VIP stand, a very tra traditional vision of womanhood uh, on display. This is the crowned teenage beauty queen. She's wearing a tiara. She has a satin sash. And she has a chaperone. The chaperone is the woman who trains her to be uh, one of the contestants. And, of course, she stands up on the stand next to all the important people who are in attendance, and she waves to the crowd and throws kisses, right? <laughs> so uh, if you go to the next slide, Dr. Jaffik, yep. you can already see that in this remote uh, Caribbean village, women's roles uh, can be largely limited to certain prescribed duties. 
Um, there is an expectation that most women will marry, that they will have children. Uh, and there are traditional gender roles that are ascribed so that women are expected to stay home, to take care of the children, uh, and the men are expected to go to work and to provide for the family, right? Many women of childbearing age, including those who have a formal education and who get to have some um, university schooling or community college schooling, once they get pregnant, they often are, uh, or at least frowned upon, or censored. Next slide, please. Okay. One of the uh, possible reasons why women are finding their roles, their traditional roles, uh, challenged have to do with economic deprivation and poverty. But that's not the whole story. We see that throughout the developing world, with the arrival of the internet, um, with the ability for women to have access to the world online, with the ability for both boys and girls to learn either at school or as, at special centers, such as the one you see in this picture, which is called the community Unity Technology Center, once they have the opportunity to become digitally literate, um, even in remote communities, um, they start seeing different ways of being in the world. They start understanding that in different societies, women, for example, don't have to prescribe role, and men don't have such a prescribed role. So they start exploring a world beyond that immediate role, uh, that immediate world that is the world upon which uh, they were brought up, and where the culture of family, of society, of religion has been prescribed, as in the case of El Sabo, for 500 years by a Hispanic uh, culture that has very gendered uh, expectations for men and women. So if you can go to the next slide, um, yep. Dr. Jambe. So inside that building uh, that you saw, there are computer uh, access points, much like the one you see in this picture now. And these uh, computer access points have been, in the case of the Dominican Republic, part of a digital inclusion project uh, sponsored by the government of the Dominican Republic. Um, about uh, 15 years ago, the government of the Dominican Republic, um, the president at that time, Leonel Fernandez, um, had a visit with uh, the president of Costa Rica in Central America and saw that in Costa Rica, the uh, MIT Media Lab, which is next door to where you guys are, uh, based in, in Boston, had tried a new system of outreach with computers. MIT Media Lab um, cut a deal with the government of Costa Rica to basically ship containers, shipping containers, full of computers um, to areas of Costa Rica that were uh, up in the mountains, that were remote, and uh, those shipping containers acted like classrooms in a way for people to learn how to use computers. So once you open the container, there were tables, there were uh, computers, and there were all the cables, and there was a satellite that operated on solar power. And so it allowed people in the mountains of Costa Rica to start learning how to use computers and how to go online um, for free, basically. So the president of the Dominican Republic saw that project, loved it, and said, I want to do the same. So he had uh, basically the same uh, agreement with MIT Media Lab. The containers got shipped to the Dominican Republic, and guess what happened? I understand you come, many of you come uh, from, probably tell me what would happen if we put a shipping container made of metal in the middle of just about anywhere in Saudi Arabia. 
Did what would happen? Did you guys hear that? So, oh, so, sorry, Dr. Prado, could you repeat the last couple of sentences because it got disconnected at some point. Okay, so what would happen if you took a shipping container made of metal and you put it in the middle of the desert in Saudi Arabia? It was sick. It was sick. Could you go inside and operate the computer to get back? No, not, uh, not an island. She was saying mountains, but she's saying if, if you put it in the desert, what would happen? No one would find it. Yeah. No one will find it? Yeah. What else would no. happen? <laughs> what, well, what are if they ones? find it, you probably won't want to go inside because it's probably going to get very hot, right? This is what happened to these computer uh, shipping containers. When they were sent to Costa Rica, they were sent up to the mountain. And then up in the mountain, they were in the jungle where it was relatively cool because there were trees to protect the shipping containers. Once they got sent to the Dominican Republic, to the Caribbean, near the equator, where the sun is really hot, they became like ovens. Right? They became really, really hot. The computers basically melted away. So nobody could go inside these shipping containers. So the government of the Dominican Republic decided, well, we've got to do something different. And that's where they started creating these buildings that you're looking at and putting the computers inside or taking classrooms in existing public schools and putting the computer inside so that people could go and start taking classes. Right? So more and more um, uh, throughout the Dominican Republic, there were these publicly funded telecenters, which is what these are called, and people, they would learn A, how to operate a computer, uh, B, how to run different software, C, how to go online, um, and they might even uh, learn simply to read and write, because in some instances, some adults didn't know how to read and write, so they might go to these computer telecenters just to learn how to read and write, and they were bypassing pen, pen and paper. They were learning how to read and write online directly. So you can go to the next slide. Okay. Now, what has happened is that as you introduce computers to an entirely new population who have not used them before, you start understanding that people who live in basically situations or conditions that are very precarious may have different uses for computers. It's not the same if you arrive in Boston and you uh, introduce somebody who has always been surrounded by technology to a computer as if you arrive in a place where there's basically no tele telephones, right? There are no fixed phone lines in some of these places and you introduce them to computers. The dynamics are different. So basically the, what I study is what happens to people when uh, they get computers for the first time and in traditional rural societies there are some things that seem uh, to be very clear that happen. Um, you can go to the next slide. Okay. So researchers like myself have examined um, in remote settings what happens, what patterns exist and how the use of computers can basically change those patterns in certain societies. Specifically, I study uh, poor, poor remote communities. So, for example, this picture that you see now should be the picture of a blue house, right? Yeah. That is a church um, in this community. It's a Protestant church. And even in these kind of uh, settings where there are institutions like church and school, we find that uh, not much is known about what happens when people join the internet, what is it that they try to find there, and what it is it that they uh, uh, can use it for that will be helpful because there's so many things they need. As you can see from this picture, there is basically a dirt floor outside, but inside there's also mostly a packed dirt floor, right? Uh, if you go to the next slide, yes, right. 
there you see one of the women I interviewed. So for this, for my research in this particular t uh, community, El Sebo, um, I interviewed Dominican girls and young adult women between the ages of 13 and 25. Um, all of them have been online at some point. All of them have been trained. This young woman you see with the baby on her lap actually knows how to write programming code. She knows how to blog. She knows how to uh, post photos online. She knows how to listen to music online. And yet, this is where she lives. This is a picture of her in front of her house. Right? This is one of three chairs that she owns. She does not have indoor plumbing. She does not have running water. She has uh, had this child at a clinic, at a local clinic, right? But uh, she basically does not have extent, any kind of uh, specialized health care to help her take care of this child. Um, the child will get vaccines from uh, nurses that come around and check on the children. But the water that, they both, that she drinks uh, so that she can breastfeed this child is contaminated. The water that she bathes in is contaminated. Um, if uh, there is any serious illness, she has to basically find enough money to take a bus to a town that is about two hours away to get proper care because the, the care that she gets at the local hospital is very precarious. And the cost of getting on a bus is basically very, very high for people who make, on average, $2 a day. Right? So the great number of people in this community live under the poverty line. So you can go to the next slide. Okay. They also don't have trash collection, so there are all kinds of other pro problems that keep them in a situation of, of dire poverty. So. When I spoke to young women, such as this one you see right now, right, um, I spoke to them and I found out that most of them log in for 15 or 20 minutes a day in these government-run telecenters. You're looking at one of the, them logged online. Um, these government-run public access points uh, are essential because you can imagine if you live in a hut like the one I showed you previously you have greater needs in your life than a computer right in fact you probably don't have electricity so these government run public access points allow people to have access to a computer because they don't have home computers in most of these homes uh, they might have a mobile phone but it's not a smartphone so whoever does have a mobile phone has a phone that is prepaid, that has limited access and probably does not have internet access still, right? Um, it's very expensive to operate their phone, right? So that even when they do make calls, they make fast calls. And uh, um, those who spend uh, time on a computer or on, on a phone are using it for very essential reasons, right? They are using them because they really need uh, to achieve a task or to accomplish a task. So that's the, one of the first things we find. So in this, um, in this case, you see, for example, a woman who says that access to the internet has changed my life a lot and has made many things easier. Well, you can imagine why. Because for those of us who are now at American universities, and we tend to easily forget how difficult the living conditions are for, for, for most people in the developing world, right? So in the Dominican Republic, uh, one out of every three people lack indoor plumbing, um, and, or, or uh, the great majority don't have any proper sanitation or proper shelter, right? So, so when you don't have the basics of life met and get some basic info on how to make your life better, such as how to keep your water clean or how to take care of your health or how to uh, learn some particular information that can then help you get a job, 
that becomes a very task-oriented use of a computer. But it seems to be absolutely essential for some of these young women. Uh, you can switch the slide, Dr. Jack. Okay. Um, as you can see, this young woman specifically wants to study to be a doctor or to be in the health professions, right? Um, about half of the, the people in the Dominican Republic work in the informal economy. The informal economy is basically uh, tradespeople or service workers, right? Uh, people who don't work for a major company or uh, in an office setting, for example, or in education or in government. Uh, um, or factories, right? The informal company economy has to do with bartering systems or sustain, uh, systems that have to do with uh, providing, uh, selling, uh, or trading goods so that you can have, have enough to, uh, to live or to eat. Women in this society face much higher unemployment than men. One third of the working age in the Dominican Republic are out of work. So that also conspires to make it so that they marry early. Uh, the average Dominican girl is married for the first time at the age of 21, which is very young for the global north. Um, and when they do, as I mentioned before, they may stop attending school and become homemakers once they have a baby, right? So faced with these kind of odds, uh, the young women I spoke to all said that Internet access changed their lives for the better. Uh, they looked to the web for academic achievement to learn what they can learn. Um, if they're too poor or if they're too overworked to travel, um, they can do college online. So that is, for example, what this young woman wants to be uh, in the health professions is doing. She, doing homework, it's fine because the money to pay for the bus fare to go to the city or to stay in the city to get a university degree that allows her to work in the uh, health, uh, uh, in healthcare. Switch the slide, Dr. Jambic. Okay. Um, still, about half the people may not even complete in high school. Right, so a college education is widely considered in the Dominican Republic to be a ticket out of rural poverty. Um, what the girls that I spoke to, when they talked about getting a college education, they had big dreams. They aspired to have uh, a career, a professional career like the ones that they read about or uh, um, online or the ones they saw on television, right? Most of them do uh, watch TV. Uh, the web has brought them that kind of knowledge. So again, very task-oriented, uh, professional aspirations, education. But as you can see from the quote uh, that this girl gave me, she said, the internet had an impact in my life. I'm no longer stay home bored. There's something else, right? So it's not all very task-oriented. There's a lot of entertainment that goes on uh, once uh, these girls are able to get online, right? Uh, they log on to social networks like Facebook. They used to use High Five a lot. I don't know if you use High Five in Saudi Arabia, um, but in uh, the Caribbean, it used to be very common. Now Facebook is available in Spanish, so uh, they use Facebook in Spanish. They check out the photos posted by their friends, they listen to music on YouTube, they check their Hotmail accounts, they do the same things that a lot of us do, right? Uh, you can go to the next uh, slide. Okay. So, like teen girls everywhere, uh, a lot of the women I spoke to are more likely uh, uh, than boys to use the web to socialize. It's a known factor that women tend to post more online and to share more online than men. This anywhere, in any country in the world, right? Men might be online a longer time, but women actually, when they do something online, they share that information with friends. And the Dominican we spoke to are uh, no different. As you can see, this one says, I'm proud of having so many friends everywhere. 
right? So they use the web to maintain friendships and um, they find it very empowering because in these small villages, there are just so many people that they know, right? There's a lot of face-to-face -face communication, but they are limited by poverty. They can't really go anywhere else because they don't have money for the ticket. So they do feel that their social life improves a lot when they go online, online and that's uh, highly valued, right? Um, so not only the education, the information, but the entertainment and the social life um, gain a tremendous boost from this access to the web. So you can go to the next slide. Okay. And you see young Anthea Laura who says, I want to move up to be someone in life. So the research that um, I have done basically shows that uh, there is a boost to self-esteem, there is increased activity that varies from task-oriented to educational, to entertainment, and to uh, uh, socializing, right? Um, but more importantly, it shows that once these girls can see or read or uh, view videos of women who can serve as role models for them, who can, who, women who elsewhere, who are doing things like becoming uh, uh, educators or becoming doctors, becoming um, engineers or becoming architects, uh, they feel that they can also do that. So it has a very important uh, uh, aspect in that it boosts self-esteem and it increases aspirational desires for women whose role used to be very limited and prescribed by the immediate society and by poverty, which is the more important structural dynamic that limits what they can do uh, in their lives. So research basically shows that um, nations that educate their girls see a rise in health indicators and a decline in mortality and fertility rates. This is called the girl effect. You, if you educate one girl, there are health improvements and decline in fertility uh, that are much more extensive than for every boy you educate. It's called the girl effect. And it's very significant to see that a mother who is educated creates a much better standard of living for their child just because they usually are more able to uh, feed that child better and keep that child in better health, right? So the mother's educational achievement becomes a significant marker for better childhood nutrition, for example, right? So education is essential in the fight against po po poverty. And um, when you add to the basic education that most countries now provide, the ability for young men and women to go online and further their education, you are then starting to compound the effect that regular education has. And you are starting to equip girls and boys to positively change and improve their lives. And by doing so, they're also improving the lives of others in their community. So you can go to the next to last slide there, okay. Dr. Jambic. In it, you see the gentleman on the slide is uh, actually a mentor. He's a, a professor of communication, and he's a mentor to Dr. Jambic and, and to myself. Uh, and the young man that uh, is with him um, has a, a really interesting story. She is a young mother. She had a child out of wedlock. So she went back to the, well, she never uh, married the, the father of the child. She stayed with her mother. She lives alone with her mother. And she really uh, dreams of becoming a journalist for her, her, her 
at the time when I interviewed her, which was nine, um, she's had these big dreams, but she was writing a book. And the book she uh, was writing and that she has since finished and has been published uh, is called Cotton Dreams. And when I asked her to tell me what Cotton Dreams was about, she uh, said this. This is the story of a child who decides to be mute because he's used to the fact that no one ever listens to anyone else. Then he happens to the book. Sorry, yes? can I interrupt? Do you mind repeating the last um, sentence, what the book is about, because I got disconnected. Okay, so this is what she tells me what the book is about. This is the story of a child who decides to be mute because he's used to the fact that no one ever listens to him. So he decides to no longer speak to his family or to anyone else. Then he happens to read a book. And this book helps him to realize there are things worth talking about. So at the end of the story, he decides to speak his first words. And his first words, words are spoken to thank God for a new day. That's how the story goes. The ending is like a beginning. So as you can see, uh, there is an incredible parallel between the story she's telling me that she wrote about and the story of these women who have, for the longest time, remained mute. Their voices could not be heard. Right? Um, in El Sable, as in many, many communities all over the developing world where four billion people are not co connected, um, girls, young and old, who are daughters and granddaughters of women who lived silently most of their lives, who could not share their personal stories, could not advocate um, in a world that is very uh, full of gender inequality, who have been oppressed by poverty, who have faced social injustice, they are, because of internet access and digital inclusion, finding their voices and finding a reason to speak up. And the book that they're reading is the internet. They are op opening the pages of the web, and for them, this is like a new beginning, a new manana. Mm -hmm. So that's the story I wanted to share with you.